It's good to have our visitors. We want to say welcome to you. We're glad that you have come to uh, worship God with us this evening. We're glad that you are here. And also, we want to remind everyone, including our members especially, of the upcoming door knocking October 21st through the 23rd. It's going to be a Friday through Sunday endeavor in which the brethren from the Centerville Road Church of Christ are going to come and assist us in uh, knocking doors. And we're going to try to knock every door in Roy City and try to reach this community with the gospel of Christ. Now, that Friday through Sunday activity will have a gospel meeting in the middle of it. Friday night, uh, 7.30, and Saturday night, 7.30, uh, Ken Hope will be preaching for us. We will be having a regular uh, gospel meeting type of service. Friday night, the 21st, who will be preaching on counting the cost. Saturday night, <clears throat> 7.30, he will be preaching on how to identify the Lord's church. Then on Sunday, I will take over and I will be giving three lessons on that Sunday, the 23rd, 9.30 a.m. for worship, Amazing Grace, then for Bible class, True Conversion, and then Sunday night, instead of a 6 o'clock service, we're going to have a 7.30 service because uh, that Sunday, between the services, we were going to knock the remainder of the doors that are left in Royce City, so that will give us a little bit of time. And so uh, Sunday night at 7.30, I'll be preaching on the kingdom of God. And so it's going to be a gospel meeting in which Ken Hope and myself will share the responsibility in uh, preaching these lessons. We will have a brochure that will list all of the times, all of the subjects, and all of the lessons. And um, that will be made available uh, as soon as they get printed up. This morning we looked at Ezekiel chapter 37. As we consider the great prophecy and teaching that's found in Ezekiel 37, we saw how that Ezekiel saw that valley of dry bones, how that valley of dry bones represented the, the remnant of God's people in Babylonian captivity, how that they would be restored back to their homeland, and that they would be spiritually resurrected. They would be revived. Those dry bones Ezekiel saw, they came together. Sinew and skin grew upon them. And they came to life. And that symbolically represented God bringing His people back to the promised land so that they could rebuild the temple, rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the walls, and prepare for something very, very significant. As we uh, said this morning, we were going to divide the, the chapter into two parts. We're going to look at Ezekiel 37, verses 15 through 28 tonight. As we continue to look at this fascinating chapter, as Ezekiel was the prophet among the common people, the captives of Judea, or Judah, there in Babylonian captivity, he was called by God to encourage them in their situation, promising them that after the 70 year period of time was over, they would be restored. They would be restored. We saw how this morning that uh, restoration and being restored back into a proper relationship with God involves effort on our part. It's not God all doing it for us. And we saw how the people had to go back to the land. They had to rebuild that temple. They had to rebuild the walls. They had to be involved, but yet it's God working through them to accomplish the goals that He has set forth in the scheme of redemption. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 15 through 28. You have Ezekiel here seeing a vision concerning a stick. It says in verse 15, Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it, for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. So there was going to be two sticks. One would have the inscription for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, and the other would have for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel, 
his companions. These two sticks would serve as a visual aid. You remember how that the kingdom was one kingdom under Saul, under David, under Solomon. Then it divided with Solomon's son making unwise choices and unwise rulership choices. The kingdom divided. Ten tribes to the north became known primarily as Israel. The two tribes to the south became known as Judah. Israel was taken away into Assyrian captivity. Then Judah lasted just a little bit longer and they were taken away into Babylonian captivity. That brings us to the book of Ezekiel. And as we look at Ezekiel, God is promising to restore his people and bring back the once divided people together again. Look at verse 17. Then join them one to another to yourself in one stick, and they will become one in your hand. So those two sticks, one representing Judah and the other representing uh, Israel, they were going to be joined together. They were divided for so long, but those two sticks would be brought together with those inscriptions on it, and it would mean unity. Verse 18, when the children of your people speak to you and saying, will you not uh, show us what you mean by this? Verse 19, say to them, thus says the Lord God, surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and will join them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. So God is not only talking about in the first part, the first 14 verses of Ezekiel chapter 37, how that the people would return to the land, there would be a a, a spiritual resurrection of them, but there would be a, a unity once again, among God's people when they go back to the promised land. Verse 20, And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. So it's going to be a visual aid. Oftentimes God would tell the prophets to do things. Some, some of the things he asked them to do were rather strange. But it served to be visual aids to teach a message to God's people. Verse 21, Then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. Verse 22. And I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. Now, in In verses 22 through the rest of the chapter, you have something significant happening. You have something significant. He's going to not only talk about the nations coming back from Babylonian captivity, the remnant people. They're going to come back. They're going to, of course, rebuild the temple, rebuild the walls, reinstitute the worship that you find in the law of Moses. They're going to go through all of that. But, God was going to do something even more significant than just bringing them back to their physical land. He was going to unify them, and also he was going to give them a king to rule over them, and they would be one. Now think about Israelite history. There was never an appointed earthly king for Judah after they returned back to the land. You had governors. You had a puppet king in Herod. But you never had a godly ordained king until you come to the New Testament. Keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that. There will be one king. Keep that in mind. One king that shall reign over them. They will not be divided anymore. Look at verse 23. They shall not uh, defile themselves anymore with idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them. 
Then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. It's very interesting that after Babylonian captivity, after the, the, the remnant was able to go back home, that the people of God from that point on never had a problem with idolatry. Before that time, what did the prophets always tell them to do? Forsake your idols. Repent of your idolatry. Worship. Stop committing spiritual adultery with these idols. After that, you don't find them talking about idols. Hardly at all. The people got the message when they went into Babylonian captivity. You don't forsake the one true living God to worship idols. And as a result, they learned that lesson. That's why he says in verse 23, they shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols. Now, a lot of things went wrong in their leadership that Christ had to deal with in the New Testament. But you know, when Jesus was preaching to the, the nation, he never preached against idolatry. He didn't have to. They learned their lesson from the Babylonian captivity. He had to deal with hypocrisy. He had to deal with corruption within the leadership. He had to deal with the false teachings that they had among the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But he never had to rebuke them for their idolatry. It was never a problem. They learned their lesson in that 70 year captivity. He says he's going to cleanse them. Also, verse 23, take away their transgression, deliver them from all their dwelling places where they have sinned and cleanse them. And he's going to be their people. God will be their God. Now notice verse 24. David, my servant, shall be king over them. Now, wait a minute. David has been dead for hundreds of years by the time Ezekiel writes. But he says, David, my servant, shall be king over them. And they shall all uh, have but one shepherd. Talking about the king. One shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes to do them. Verse 25. Then they shall dwell in the land, and I have given to Jacob my servant, where your fathers dwell, and they shall dwell there, they and their children and their children's children forever, and my servant David shall be prince over them. That's the second time he mentions David. David would be their king. He would be the prince over them. He would be the king over them. He would be their shepherd. But yet David is dead. Notice verse 26. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. A covenant of peace. He also calls it, uh, and it should, uh, he says in verse 26, it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. Well, didn't he make a covenant with them? At Mount Sinai. Didn't he make a covenant with Abraham? Long time before that. He's going to make a covenant of peace. An everlasting covenant with them. He says in verse 26. And I will establish them and multiply them. And I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. There was going to be a dwelling there with God among his people. Forever. Verse 27. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. He said that in verse 23. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. There's going to be a fellowship there that seems to be different than the fellowship that they now presently have with God. Notice verse 28. It says, the nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in, the midst, in their midst forever. In other words, he is going to dwell among his people. Now, let's try to see what God is saying through Ezekiel. Is he just talking about the people just returning to their land and just having the temple and just having the animal sacrifices and just having uh, Jerusalem rebuilt? Is there something more significant that we find in the New Testament that is a fulfillment of these verses? The reason why the people went back to the land was not just to get some Hebrew people back in the land. There was going to be a greater fulfillment that God was working towards since the book of Genesis. The coming of his son into the world. 
I submit to you tonight that Jesus Christ is the David and the shepherd of this prophecy. He's not talking about literally David. David's dead by the time Ezekiel is writing this. But there would be one who would be a shepherd and would be a king over God's people. I submit to you it's talking about Christ. Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 tells us that uh, Jesus Christ, according to the flesh, is a descendant of David, declared to be the Son of God by His resurrection from the dead. So He is a descendant of King David. Remember, it was given to King David a, a promise that from his seed, one of his descendants would rule. And so this David here in verse 24, I believe, is a prophecy about Christ. Christ is a descendant of King David. He is in that royal lineage. And he would rule. We see that over and over again in the New Testament. That he would be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Also, he would be a shepherd. He would be a shepherd that rules his people. John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and the verse 11 speaks of Jesus, and he says, I am the good shepherd. He says it again in verse 14, referring to himself as the shepherd. His sheep hear him, listen to him, follow him, and he gives them eternal life. And in verse 16, John 10 and verse 16, he says this, There will be one shepherd and one flock. Unity among God's people. There would be one shepherd and one flock as Christ is talking about himself as being their leader and the church being his people. One shepherd and one flock. I believe that David here, the shepherd here, this one who would be prince, this one who would be king, is talking about a descendant of David. Not David himself, but a descendant of David, Jesus Christ, as we see the fulfillment of it in the New Testament. Also, as we look at this prophecy, it talks about the covenant of peace, the everlasting covenant. Well, I believe that this is referring to the everlasting covenant of peace of the New Testament. It's talking about the New Testament that Jesus gave to us by his death. And so Jesus brought about a new covenant, a new testament. You know, the book of Hebrews tells us about this and how important and how great Jesus is, that he's greater than Moses, he's greater than the prophets, he's even greater than the angels. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 17, the Hebrew writer says, For this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant. And I believe this new covenant is this everlasting covenant of peace that Ezekiel is speaking of in Ezekiel chapter 37. He is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. That would be the law of Moses. That those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Verse 16. For where there is a testament, there also of necessity must be the death of the testator. Verse 17. For a testament is in force after men are dead since it has no power at all while the testator lives. So by Jesus' death, he brought an end to the first covenant and initiated the new covenant, or the New Testament. We have it in our Bibles as Matthew through Revelation. That is that everlasting covenant of peace that brings peace between us and God. That brings peace when we carry out the principles and the law of that covenant between us and our fellow man. He is that prince of peace and the mediator of this new covenant. And by his death he initiated this everlasting covenant of peace. And finally, it talks about the sanctuary and the tabernacle. The holy place, the sanctuary, where God's presence was in the Old Testament. That was true of the tabernacle that Moses built by the instructions that God gave to him, the pattern that God gave. He built that uh, tabernacle. Then later on, 
Solomon built the temple, and that represented God's dwelling place. His presence was there. But this this sanctuary and tabernacle of this everlasting covenant of peace is referring to Israel as a people, and I believe it's referring to the church. The church. He's referring to his people of the New Testament. That he would dwell among his people and they would be sanctified, they would be holy because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He initiated that covenant of peace. And through his death on the cross, he purchased the church with his own blood. Acts 20 and verse 28. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 16 through chapter 7 and verse 1 tells us something. That God dwells among his people. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16. He says, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. Now who's he talking to? He's talking to Christians. He's talking to saints. He's talking to the Lord's church at Corinth. And he says, You are the temple of the living God, as it is said. I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Doesn't that sound like Ezekiel chapter 37? They shall be my people. Verse 17, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. There's that special, significant relationship that they did not get by simply going back to the land and by simply rebuilding the temple and rebuilding Jerusalem. He's talking about the the institution of the church that was brought about by the new covenant and that was brought about by the death of Jesus Christ. Chapter 7 and verse 1 of 2 Corinthians, he says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, a sanctified people, so that God may dwell among His people, so that His people may be a sanctuary, a tabernacle, a dwelling place for God. And in the New Testament, did you know that the church is sometimes referred to as Israel? Not physical Israel, but spiritual Israel. That is sometimes a description of the church that we overlook. But it's found in certain passages like Romans chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, that the church of Christ is the Israel of God in the New Testament. Romans chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, Paul says, But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. In other words, not everyone is of Israel who has been a descendant or is a descendant of Jacob or literal Israel. Verse 7, Romans 9 and verse 7. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. In other words, there are those, if you read the context of Romans chapter 9, who are not descendants of Abraham physically, but they are of Israel. And the Israel of the New Testament, God's people, is the church. You know, you read Colossians chapter 2. In verse 12, he talks about baptism. Paul does. And he says in baptism, we're buried with Christ in baptism. And he talks about also in that context how a spiritual circumcision takes place. A circumcision without hands. The circumcision of Christ. Spiritual Israel. In the book of Galatians, chapter 6 and verse 16 Paul makes this statement in his closing remarks. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. As those who walk according to this rule, the rule, the way of God that's found in the New Testament, salvation through Jesus Christ and through the plan of salvation that He gave in His 
everlasting covenant of peace. Peace be upon them and the Israel of God. You know, when a person obeys the gospel, when they believe in Jesus with all of their heart, they confess Him as the Son of God, repent of their sins. You know, Paul tells us in Galatians 3, 27 through 29, that we're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And in verse 29, he speaks of how that we are Abraham's descendants or seed. And heirs according to the promise. Spiritually speaking, I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm an heir of the promises that were given to him. We're studying Abraham and the book of Genesis in our Wednesday night class. And we looked at all those promises that were given to him. That in him, all nations of the earth would be blessed. Referring to Christ. And when a person believes in Christ and obeys that gospel... They become part of spiritual Israel, the church. So as we have looked at Ezekiel chapter 37, we have seen that there is a much greater significance than just the people returning to the land. They were not just returning to the land just to start things over again. They were returning to the land so that they might fulfill the scheme of redemption that God had from the very beginning. So that Christ could come into the world. And that through Jesus Christ, that one shepherd, that prince, that David, who is the servant of God, through his death on the cross, he would usher in the everlasting covenant of peace, establish his tabernacle, his church, spiritual Israel. And those who obey him would become part of spiritual Israel and enjoy all the spiritual blessings that are found in Christ Jesus. And the only way to get there is through baptism. If you haven't been baptized into Christ tonight, we urge you to do so. Baptize into Him so the blood can remove all your sins and you can become a part of spiritual Israel, the church. If you are a part of this kingdom, this church, but you've gone astray, you're rebellious to the King, repent, come back to Him, and He will welcome you with open arms. As always, the choice is yours. While we stand and we sing.